Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight for Side by Side, a presentation of three short plays by Jory Post. I'm Deborah Bryant, and I'm a member of 36 North, a playwrights collective based in Santa Cruz, California. We're pleased and excited to bring you tonight's show, which we hope will be the first in a series of quarterly readings of plays by our members. We're really happy that you've joined us for the first leap into a new medium. As everyone probably knows or can imagine from their own Zoom experiences by now, online theater presents some unique challenges. Our talented actors are coming to you from their own homes and they and their directors have had to find creative ways to put these plays across with the minimum of props and movement. If we encounter technical difficulty, please bear with us as we try to solve it. This is live theater after all, anything can happen. To ensure your best viewing experience, make sure you open your Zoom window as wide as possible so you can see the two actors in each play side by side. The first and last plays each run about 10 minutes and the middle play is about 25 minutes. If time permits, we will have a short Q&A with the actors, directors, and jury after the show. And now, without further ado, our first play, Bench, directed by Susan Forrest and starring Susan Forrest and Steve Capasso. Hello, anybody there? What really bothers me is your need to know whether I'm bothered by an action you've already taken that you have no intention of reversing if in fact I tell you it bothers me. Wow, do you know you used a form of the word bother three times in that sentence? Yes. Yes what? Yes, it bothers you that I'm here or yes, you know about your rather tedious sentence structure? Both. Oh, the golden hour. Or the magic hour. And it's not really an hour. It varies according to season and latitude. In some places, because the sun doesn't reach an altitude of 10 degrees, the magic hour lasts the entire day, depending on the season. And then this? What? Well, you, you barely acknowledge my existence here, and then you give me the... Britannica version of how and why the sun sets. The Milagro Beanfield War. Redford used it a lot. I like the golden hour better than the magic hour. And Terence Millick did it best in the New World. The entire film was shot in it. Ah, oh, yes, but very expensive to do. Screws mm -hmm. up the film's budget. Yes, clouds, rain. It can push the shooting schedule out weeks or or months. If you keep talking, you're going to miss this one. Days of Heaven was another one. They only had 25 minutes a day when they could film. The more amazing thing was that Almendros was going blind when they filmed it. He made his assistant shoot every scene with a Polaroid so he could view it with a magnifying glass later. Glad I stopped by. I've learned so much already. Oh, I don't like sarcasm, sprinkled like salt to what some people think is a degree of taste of what they say. Oh, give me a break. Why are you here? On your bench? Not my bench. It's a public bench, you know. Of course I do, but you could have waited. Huh. What? Not enough time for that. <laughs> Always with the sarcasm. Just sometimes. <sighs> I think we've got about five minutes of gold left. Let's capture this. Oh, uh, I don't want to be in any pictures today. Oh, it's a little late for that, buddy. Just one more for the album. You are a bit deranged, you know. And you are just a whole lot of stick up the ass, you know? Mm. 
I'm sorry. Yes, you are. I'm serious. Not usually. I know, but you make up for me and then some. <laughs> I suppose. Where'd you get that from? Not, not him or, or her. Maybe it was the milkman. No, that's better. More likely great-grandma. Right. Always such the contrarian. Do you remember the time she started complaining about my face? Puffing on her Virginia Slims, circling my head, turning sideways, snorting, and then finally saying, what did you do to your nose? <laughs> so you thumbed it at her. <laughs> I did. She had three slims going by the time that conversation was over. Well, I definitely got some of her genes. But why didn't you? Well, who says I didn't? Well, none that you ever shared. Well, that's the trick, isn't it? Oh, uh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> no, you've always been so literal. Never learned how to hide. Oh, I tried, but uh, some people didn't let me. Oh, bullshit. I have let you hide all our whole damn lives, and this bench is no place to hide. They'll all be trotting down here in a few minutes with the ashes. Which is why I wanted some alone time before being inundated. Do I inundate you? Uh, sometimes. Would you like me to leave? It's too late for that. Hmm. No, 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 stay, stay. If you insist. Well, I wouldn't say it so strongly. Let's just say I won't resist. Oh, bother. Yes, sometimes you are. Aren't we all? Hmm. Oh, crap. Oh. Mm. Two more minutes. Mm. She was pumping the champagne just before I got over. And Billy and Juanita were polishing the crystal for her. And Jen brought a key lime pie from Gales. <laughs> I'm surprised we're not having a marching band. Oh, you mean the plans changed? <laughs> Sometimes you're funny. How'd this thing turn out anyway? Oh, they always do. Nice work. I see you talked her out of that quote. Oh, God, yes. I mean, it's more than I can handle to know his name and his birth and death dates are plastered out here forever for the whole walking world to see. For every golden lab and black lab to lift a leg on. So I put my foot down on that quote. Well, thank you for that. Oh, hmm. uh, whoops, uh, six feet. <laughs> <sighs> uh, looks like our time is just about up. Hmm, just about. Can I have a hug? Let's make it a virtual one. Does that bother you? Mm, usually. Does it bother you now? Not so much. Oh, here they come. Thank you, Susan and Steve. Next up, Season Tickets, directed by Steve Spike Wong and starring Spike Wong and Helene Simkinhara. The setting for this play is the Curran Theater in San Francisco. The, ta the play takes place in three scenes, before the curtain rises, 
on the evening show, during intermission and after the show has ended. To indicate scene changes, the actors will turn their cameras off and on again. Excuse me, please. Thank you so much. What? I know you speak, I've seen it before. Do you? Do I what? Do I know why there's always an understudy on my nights? Why I can never just once see a pure performance as the director intended with the original cast? When you? When, when I what? When I pay this much goddamn money for tickets, season tickets, I might add, do I expect to be treated like a princess? Yes, I do. When you, do you, you know, the entrance thing? Have you ever considered the stage? Perhaps something like early Demosthenes? I may have a bag of marbles in my bag if you'd like to work on that diction. When people enter a row, the normal mode of entry, and when I say normal, I mean what I have observed while sitting in this very seat for 30 some years. 33. What? Not 30 some, just say 33, because I think that's what you really mean. Listen, the typical style of entry when passing someone who was already seated, as I've come to expect and believe is standard and accepted behavior is to face the stage. But you, you face the audience with your backside to the stage and the, the front of you, right in front of my face. Already, so soon this is about sexuality. Because what you're saying is that the proximity of genitalia as I pass you face to face is less normal more sensual, sexual, uh, than if my ass is pressed into your crotch as you stare at the back of my skirt when I move by. I said nothing about proximity of genitalia. Since when does theater etiquette have to become a discussion about sexuality? Isn't it just a matter of preference? I mean, this or this? You're quite forward, aren't you? Or pun, if intended. Which is okay. I know what you like. I've seen you. I've watched you. You know very little. It is, you know. It is what? Theater etiquette. It is about sexuality. It's all foreplay. Every inch of it. See how you are? You could have said, every piece of it, or every part of it, or every bit of it. But no, your preference is to say every inch of it to bring penis size into the discussion before we even know each other's names. It's, it's every piece of clothing you slip into, every button snapped, every nose hair trimmed, uh, how expensive the bottle of wine, cologne or not, it's about the pairing, the potential pairing. What do you mean you've watched me? It's what I do. It's what we all do. What did you see? Where to begin? Oh, how about 30 some years ago? 33. No, no, you didn't know then. Didn't know what? About the foreplay. <laughs> but you think I know now? Oh, I know you know now. Tell me. You should be paying me for this. I think I already have. I, I don't understand. Go on. Well, where to begin? You already said that. Yes. How about Wicked 2009? Okay. What about it? I think, I think it was June. It was June 4th. That's impressive. It's what I do. Do you remember your date that night? 
No, well, maybe. I do. How can you possibly remember that? I think she was possibly 10 years younger than you, maybe 45, 46. Long black hair in a bun, too black, probably dyed. Uh, nice shoulders, bare shoulders. Do you remember her now? She wore a royal blue skirt. She had white sheer blouse. When she walked in front of you to take her seat, you stayed seated and you ran your hand up the inside of her leg. Are you making this up? How could you see that? Did you enjoy Patty Duke as Madame Morrible? I enjoyed the nostalgia. I was happy she was still working, but she made me feel old. I liked Carol Kane's portrayal better. She wore rectangular earrings, platinum or titanium, new age, artsy. Carol Kane or Patty Duke? Your black hair date. There was, a, there was a blue stone dangling, maybe a sapphire in the center of the rectangle. Oh, her, Connie. It was a fake sapphire. I didn't see her again. And neither did I. She wore too much makeup. Yes. I don't think you like women with makeup. It was a first date, friend of a friend. Takes longer than that, doesn't it? What does? The foreplay. Oh, there you go again. We don't even know each other. Oh, we've got a couple of minutes. Connie, Connie wasn't like the other woman. Oh, you mean my wife? I was never sure. Long-time girlfriend, lover, wife. I never had an angle of the ring finger. Mm. It was November 6th, 1992, Les Mis. How do you do that? What? The dates, eidetic memory? <laughs> no, it's, uh, I don't know. It's just linkage. I make connections. Three days after Clinton was elected, I met her at a Clinton rally. A celebration then? Our first anniversary. I liked her. You didn't even know her. Celebration that lasted, what, uh, 15 years? The last time I saw her was at Legally Blonde. At, at the next show, the curtain went up and your seats were still empty. I panicked a little. You didn't even know us. But I always saw everything. I told you, just two rows back. Perfect angle. I know where you sat. Is that surprising? The second time, Virginia Woolf, it wasn't panic anymore, it changed. I thought maybe you'd both been killed in a car accident or, or were on an extended vacation to Europe. But no one knew about the tickets. At least you hadn't sold them or given them away. No, no one sat there for 10 months. I, I couldn't enjoy any of those shows. From my seats back there, the line of sight to center stage cuts right through these two seats your seats for 10 whole months. Every scene that played at center stage, which is most of them, I was just staring just above these two empty seats, wondering what the hell happened. And then there you were. It was the color purple. I saw you walk in by yourself. I watched you take your seat. I actually felt my heart bounce against my ribs a little. Well, I waited and I kept looking back up the aisle up to, to, until the house lights flickered and finally the curtain rose. December 8th, 2008, but she never came. No. You thought she was maybe in the bathroom? Yes. But she wasn't. No. She was mostly a good wife uh, until she wasn't. 
What did you mean before? About what? You said you knew about my seat. When did you first notice me? 30 some years ago. I first noticed you 33 years ago, standing by your seat after the show, waiting for the row to clear. Hello, Dolly, Carol Channing. Yes. <laughs> Back of your head is what I saw first, your neck wrapped in a lavender scarf and the near buzz haircut. It made your head look like an egg in some kind of exotic nest. That's it? No. What else? You inched your way to the aisle. I was behind you, my eyes tilted down, watching your shoes. You like shoes? I do. Well, not just the shoes, not all shoes, but the way they fit around feet, whether or not people seem comfortable in them, or if they're poured into them like some jello mold. Then I saw your flats, maroon and lavender, soft. You know, I never once saw your eyes. When? Ever. You must have a huge bladder. I mean, you always stayed in your seat during intermission, and I always left before you. So when you passed in front of me earlier... Th that was the first time I ever saw your eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And please, no photographs or video are allowed at this performance. Welcome to the Best of Broadway production of Next to Normal. What do you mean when you said, I think I have, when I said you should be paying me for this? Intermission. Is everything okay? Uh, yes, why wouldn't it be? No reason, I was just... Why? D did I do something? No, not really. You were just clapping after everyone stopped. I, I was? Oh, I, I do get lost sometimes. Drift into a trance. I... I was surprised by the first act. How so? Well, to be honest, I'm always surprised by first acts. Why? I never read the reviews. I have no idea what the shows will be about. Ever? Ever. A few hundred shows I never know, except revivals. Wow, it's complete opposite for me. I'll buy the script in advance and read it a few times before the show. You see, that's what I'm talking about. What? This, what we're doing right now. You mean watching a play? All of it, the whole thing, every inch of it. Here we go again. Not again, we've never stopped. <sighs> ha! Are you crazy? I have this friend in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz? It's actually called Capitola. My parents used to take me there as a kid. Capitola by the sea. I had a cottage these... on the cliff overlooking the village. And there were these little green and white cabins down by the boardwalk. You should see my backyard full of roses. My parents would leave me in the casino while they spent the day on the roller coaster. I spent a lot of time in the garden. I had a marble bag I emptied before our trips. Roses need constant care. I'd save up nickels and dimes, put them in my marble bag. The proper care of roses is an art, you know. I play the pinball machines all day long, an acquired skill. I have a friend who writes prose poetry. No punctuation anywhere. He doesn't even use titles anymore. I think I would hate that. I'm starting to understand that. 
What's that supposed to mean? I can't avoid the titles of shows because they're on the tickets, on the contracts everywhere. But I refuse to read the reviews. I mute the TV if I see a commercial for one. I ignore the entertainment pages. What do you mean you're starting to understand that? Understand what? You never answered my question. What question? Well, what did you mean when you said, I think I have, when I said you should be paying me for this? Oh, that. I'm not sure it's a good idea to get into that. A little late, I think. But before we continue, I need to tell you I have to pee in a little minute. Why do I need to be warned? Because I want you to tell me your preference when I stand to leave, face forward or back. Surprise me. Oh, I like that. Why do you think you've already paid me? Shouldn't you pee now before you have an accident? If you make me sit here and wait, it won't be an accident. It'll be an intentional sabotage on your part to make me soil the seat. Oh, this feels a little passive aggressive to me. It absolutely is not passive aggressive. This is directly aggressive to your passive aggressive statement about me being paid for something. The something was you telling me about the foreplay. See, you were paying attention. Okay, 33 years ago, where were your seats? Way back there. As were mine. How about 25 years ago? I get the picture. And oh. we're so close to the stage now, they don't upgrade us anymore. Haven't done so in 10 years. And where are you sitting now? I don't like rhetorical questions. Okay. Why do you think you're sitting here now? I know exactly why I'm sitting here now. <laughs> I don't think you do. I've seen this empty seat ever since your wife disappeared. I went to Harold in ticket management and asked him if he could arrange to secure it for me. I tipped him a hundred dollars. What seat? Pepper spray. Hi there. Hello. 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 Uh, <clears throat> that's my preference. I tipped Harold one hundred and fifty dollars to offer you the seat. Uh, oh God! Oh Harold, you're so much better at this than we are. Um. Did you enjoy the contents of my bag? I assume that's why you left it? Well, I do like to observe when I'm being observed. And hasn't that been going on all night? See, you are starting to get it. Why did you clap so long at intermission? I believe that question takes us beyond foreplay. It's not the question that takes us there, it's the answer. As I've said, I didn't know what this play was about. I didn't know what the title was trying to tell me. By the end of the first act, I did. And I was lost in my head, a little sick to my stomach. I've read the play three times, knew what was coming, and I was a little lost as well. What do you mean? Uh, you were stuck in your trance. Didn't notice that I never started clapping. Wasn't sure I wanted to clap. By the time I got through fighting with myself about it, the clapping was over, except yours. Well, I know why I was lost. Oh. Why were you? I wasn't really lost. More that I was all too found, undressed, laid bare. I have a son like her. I, I had never heard the term 
next to normal before. But by the time she was in the hospital bed in the straitjacket at the end of the last scene, I understood. I recognized some of her behaviors. You have a son like her? I have a me like her. How do you deal with it? How do I deal with it? I have season tickets to the best of Broadway. I, I play racquetball with friends. Smashing little rubber balls is better than crystal or china. I, I walk. I do yoga. I have pills, but I try not to take them. It, it comes and goes. What about your son? He took the pills, all of them. Oh, final act, Let, let's see how it goes. Why did you stand? Why did you not clap? We are very different people. I would certainly hope so. Well, did you stand because others were standing? Thought it was the thing to do? Or did you really love the message of this play? None of those things. I didn't notice other people except you not clapping. I hated most of this play hated this playwright holding up a mirror to my face. I refuse to clap or stand for something that makes me feel so horrible about myself, about the people around me, about every single person alive. The roses help me. I bought myself a pinball machine, put it in the kitchen. I can tell you the Latin name of every rose in my garden. I bought it the day she left. Why did she leave? She couldn't stand to live with the ghost of my son lingering in the house. Couldn't stand seeing him in my face. Me, me acting as if he was still alive. What about you? What about me what? All these years, I never once saw you with the same man or woman twice. <laughs> you should see my garden. No, no, really, you should. Wow. That is impressive. Over a hundred varieties. No two alike. Same with my play dates. You say impressive, but I'm guessing what you mean is obsessive. Some of each. Well, roses are easier than people. <laughs> they can draw blood if you're not careful, but people always draw blood. Why did you pay Harold to get you the seat? <laughs> oh, we have suddenly jumped well beyond foreplay and are now threatening penetration. You see how you are? Yes, I do. I do see how I am. That's part of the problem. But you paid good money for a seat that put you next to me, possibly for the duration of your season ticket life. How does that work? I don't know yet how it works. Why did you pay Harold to move me closer to you? My fear, my hope, is that our reasons are similar. I, I think it's about companionship. No, no way. That's not it at all for me. Every single one of my single dates over the years have been companions of sorts. My roses are companions. I don't need any more of that. I'm guessing Harold can swap your seat back if you want. That's not what I want. And, and I don't think that's 
what you want. What do you think I want? Your pinball machine. Your son still alive. Your, your wife back. A trip to the boardwalk to spend the day at the casino. You don't need companions for that. And what do you want? To look out at the Capitola Wharf from my backyard and the company of my roses. To fill an empty seat. I do believe you're tricking yourself by saying it's not about companionship, even if you call it something else. Something else like what? I don't know. What is it really? 33 years worth of it. Maybe it's not companionship. Maybe it's familiarity. Bingo. Or play over. I missed you when your seats were empty. I was sad when your wife was gone. At some point, you were the only thing familiar to me outside of my garden. I figured it was worth $100 to try to recover some of that. And how's that going for you? It's going. How about you? Mostly OK. But there's still the other thing. Yes. I'm not normal. I don't know anybody who is. I'm Sheila. Barry. Thank you, Helene and Spike. Our final play tonight is After Effects, directed by Wilma Marcus Chandler and starring Ali Mack and Nat Robinson. What are you playing? What? What are you playing? Oh, I finished Solitaire and I'm on to Spelling Bee. Mm, what are the letters today? S-E-K-M-R-B-A. Did you get it yet? No. You want to know it? No. You mean you already know it just listening to the letters? Yeah. I don't know how you do that. I don't either. Seriously, how do you do it? What's your process? Process? Yeah. I never really thought about it. You say the letters, and as you say them, I place them onto a little board in my head, shake them around, and mix them up. I guess it's a spatial relationship thing. <laughs> Blows me away. All right, tell me. I'll tell you what. The pangram. Oh, not into the purity thing today? <laughs> I just don't want that word clogging up space in that brain. Spit it out. Embarks. You want more? Oh, of course it's embarks. Yes, please, more. Breaks, uh -huh. bakers, uh -huh. makers, uh -huh. embarrass, uh -huh. re-embarks, berserk, uh -huh. Breakers, remake. Wait, 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 slow down. What was after Berserk? Breakers. Oh, that's fucking fascinating. What? Your brain. No different than yours. Oh, uh, it's way different than mine. Why do you even say that? Spelling bee. Solitaire. Whatever book that you're listening to, all while you're having a conversation with me. Multitasking. <laughs> What's the book today? Oh, I'm embarrassed to say it. It's for the new online book group. Come on, out with it. Ugh, fine, all right. It is Janet Ivanovich, One for the Money. <laughs> really? I know, it's pablum. But this reader is excellent, and it makes it easier to get through. And you're going to have an intelligent discussion about that? Mm, that's the theory. It's Saturday at 10. How's your new one? Ah, Victor Ludano, his latest, called Edgar and Lucy. What's it about? I can't tell you that. You're going to want to read it. Well, give me a hint. OK, part of a blurb, not the whole thing. On every page, 
Lodato's prose sings with a robust, open-hearted wit, making Edgar and Lucy a delight to read. <clears throat> That's it. No spoilers. Why do you like this so much? He's an award-winning playwright, an award-winning poet, and now he's writing fiction. And it all comes together in this whirlwind that slices the top of your head off. Like Catch-22. Uh, kind of, but that was more than a head. Mm -hmm. That was half of a body. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? I'm looking for Heller. I want to read that packet. <laughs> God damn it. Once a week. Oh, but this time I had them alphabetized. You know there's a name for this. Don't start in on me with that OCD ranting. I've never ranted. Huh, right. No, uh, I'm talking about our mountains of books. There's a name for it. Uh -huh. I read it on Jeopardy last week. Yeah, I believe the name for it is called <laughs> Reading. You're upsetting the dog. It's uh -huh. called Reading. It is an incontrollable, it's an uncontrollable love of reading. I'm sorry. That's for sure. But there's a Japanese name for it. I wrote it down. There, Sundoku. <laughs> that sounds like a sushi order. Uh, <laughs> it's from the Meiji era of the late 1800s, where they combine Sunday Oku to pile things up ready for later with Dokoshu, reading books. Sundoku, the piling of books to read later. No, you're kidding. It's a real thing. Show me. Ooh. Huh, who knew? Mm. I love it. Finally, a little validation. Hmm? Listen to this. Learning kindness late in life was a kind of torture. The pain often came from the past, from kindnesses withheld. The knife was particularly sharp when those who most deserved your kindness were long gone. Unless you wanted to die of sorrow, you had to give this unspent kindness to those you loved less. What? Lodato wrote that. Mm -hmm. I want that. <laughs> when you're done. How long till you're done? I don't know. This is one of those books, you know, where you have to go back and let the slow burn take yeah. hold, yeah. read over what you just read, and make sure you read it right. Mm -hmm. Maybe a week. You want me to put it on your tower? Uh, Lodato? L? No, that would go right in the middle. I'd have to rebuild the whole thing. The pillow. Just put it on the pillow. Really? The pillow? I thought that we agreed that the pillow was restricted to specific items. Uh, right. What we agreed to was defined by the word immediacy. You wake up in the middle of the night with an idea that won't let you sleep. So you grab this, you find a pillow pen, transcribe your brilliance onto paper, and immediate need is gratified. Right. Immediate. Like these tissues. You could wake up in the middle of the night with a runny nose, no more having to wipe your sleeve. <laughs> Immediate need gratified. Yes. Or, or this. The headlamp. Headlamp. Pinpoint of light on an early morning read. But these three books, you've been claiming this space for months now. You haven't touched any of them. This pillow was not structurally designed to hold another I, tower. I don't want to talk about this right now. Now or ever. What I want is Edgar and Lucy. Here, on the pillow, when you're done with it. Please. Do you think that please ends it? I can go downstairs if you'd like. You know that's not what I want. Well, what? Why then? We have to talk about this. What I want is for you to understand how that affected me. And I want it available to me as soon as possible. I do understand that. But given that you brought it up, let's talk about availability. No. Forget it, okay? Just keep your damn book. What else? What else what? S-E-K-M-R-B-A. Berserk. You already said that. Yeah, as in you make me. Smearers, abasers, erasers. <laughs> that makes us a genius. Now it's on to the queen bee. No, yeah, please. I'm done. This has gone on for too long. Oh, 
there's got to be a few more You here. know what I mean. I'm not ready. You keep saying that, but I am ready. We can't put this off any longer. Damn you, what do you want to talk about? Let's start with the pillow. Oh, come on. You love the pillow. That's a bit of a stretch. I have learned how to use it since you put it there. And you know why it's there. That doesn't mean I have to like it or agree with it. Six months is too long. I didn't know that I was being timed. It's affecting our friendship, our relationship. Well, some things are more important. Do you really believe that? I don't know what I believe Nothing anymore. is more important to me. I wish it would have been me who miscarried. But it wasn't. And you've said that before. And I'll keep saying it. Are you going to say anything? This guy. What a writer. I wouldn't know, since you're reading it so damn slowly. The Francine prose way. Why don't you order an ebook copy on your reader on your iPad and we can have a two person book group? I don't feel like discussing much of anything with you right now. But you keep at it, knocking my books over, looking for a reaction out of me. What's really going on? Pillow talk. Maybe you'd be back. I don't want alphabetical. I know, I know. Chronological, but how am I supposed to know that? You do know it. Become a time traveler. One point of reference. Before and after miscarriage. Or ask me. To the lighthouse. I reread her every January at the bottom. Thank you. You know where that goes. Emperor of all maladies, right in the middle. I read that nonstop while you were in the hospital. One hand on your wrist, another on the book. You were so sweet. Even if I hadn't recognized it. Up until that point, I thought that losing a parent was the worst that could happen, but losing a baby was, is a whole nother magnitude. You lost a baby. I lost a baby and a wife. But you gained a pillow. Yes, I did. <sighs> Whoa. Uh, what are you doing? Well, I need that. I have a lot of, I have some important stuff. In I'm sorry for being pushy. No, you're not. <laughs> but thank you. Well, hello. Well, hello to you. I'm still not ready for sex. I know. More, please. Remind me. You think you'd have them? S E K M R B A. Where'd I leave off? Uh, erasers. Right. Ambers, mm -hmm. asters, mm -hmm. mambas, <gasps> karmas. That's, that's it. 
I'm a queen bee. Read to me. Mm -mm, no spoilers. Read to me. Okay. Just a little. Words weren't a solace. <laughs> Come on, buddy. We haven't been close in a long time, huh, oh, sweetheart? so long, little man. Words weren't a solace, but they focused one's emotions into something more tangible. They were splinters that could actually be pulled from the heart and placed on a table, regarded. Thank you, Nat and Allie. We'd like to bring back all the actors along with Wilma and Jory. Can you folks all please turn your cameras back on? All those of, of you in the audience might want to set your Zoom screen to gallery view at this point so you can see everyone all at once. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Great show. Now, how about a round of applause for the playwright, Jory Post, for giving these actors such a great time to work with. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it looks like we have time for a few questions and for, for any of the actors, the directors, or for Jory you can use the chat function. And in some cases, depending on your uh, software, you may not be able to use the chat function. So we're screening both chat function and the Q&A section of the webinar. So um, just go ahead and click in the chat or the Q&A and type your question. While we're waiting for that, I'll get us started with a question for Jory. Jory. Can you tell us a little bit about what this process has been like for you, both as a playwright, seeing your work in this medium, and as a tech guy who had to figure all of this out, how to do it? <laughs> well, it's been one of the most fascinating processes I've been involved in, both in identifying the initial problems and in trying to discover the solution. Yeah, I am a bit of a tech guy, have been for quite a while, but for us to get to the point of performing these three plays tonight required a large team of folks working at it for a couple of months. Our fearless leader for this project, our producer, the one who was doing legwork every day, the one who motivated and inspired me is Kathy Chetkovich. And our 36 yeah. North Playwrights Collective members were instrumental in making this happen with Susan Forrest, Steve Capasso, Steve Spike Wong as actors, Wilma Marcus Chandler, Susan and Spike as directors, and also along with um, Helene Sim Simpkin-Hara, Ali Mack, and Nat Robinson as local talent. So it really took a lot of us to get to the point of getting this together. In the beginning, I mean, um, most of you probably didn't, I think one person uh, sent me an email uh, during the, um, season ticket saying he saw the characters backwards uh, talking the other way but i didn't hear that from anybody else but in the beginning we struggled with zoom meeting because we couldn't get the desired side by side effect using it so um, we eventually discovered that zoom webinar was a much better solution and was available as an add-on so we switched over but even after we switched it was difficult locating info to help us proceed. So the first two plays you noticed, Bench and Season Tickets, are called two-handers, meaning that there's two actors in the play. And because of COVID and the need for actors to be in separate locations, 
we had to simulate it looking as if they were in the same scene by using virtual backgrounds. For bench, Kathy went out to Westcliff Drive and took photos of benches and I manipulated them in Photoshop and Illustrator, then chopped them in half and shared them with Susan and Steve. Same thing with season tickets that set at the Curran Theater. Uh, I found an image, chopped it in half and shared it with Spike and Helene. We didn't have to worry about that um, split screen virtual background thing with the third play After Effects, but there were other things that were difficult about that. Um, the alignment from left to right was the huge one. We struggled with it. I didn't sleep well. I don't think Kathy did either, but we finally broke through with uh, the help of some true techies. Kathy set up a meeting with Mike Ryan of Santa Cruz Shakespeare, and he provided us with all the answers we needed to proceed. Um, so that was the breakthrough. Now, I know that the actors and the directors of these plays also face challenges not usually associated with rehearsals. So maybe they'd like to tell you a little bit about their experiences. Susan. Yeah, actually, I see a question in here. Maybe both Steve and I can answer it. They're both related to the bench. Yes. Uh, first one is, what was the relationship between woman and man in the bench? We did have the same grandmother. So I would say we were either sister and brother or cousins. Jory, Jory do you want to? I felt like we were sister and brother. Yeah. That was the intent. Yeah. And then the other one was, um, uh, what was it like to, oh, and this is also for the other two frame people. One thing that was difficult for us was to make sure that we were sitting at the same height and, you know, that sort of thing. And um, so I, I, bought, I, I bought a big piece of green cloth I had two um, stools that are exact same height. I took over a stool and one half of that cloth to Steve. He's doing it in his garage. And I'm doing it in a little room that has a lot of lighting in it right now. So, it, but it was fun. It was fun figuring that out. Yeah, um, this, this person also in the Q&A says, was it difficult, weird, surprising, fun? What was it like acting in these roles? Yeah, all, all of the above. It was a bit strange in the beginning to be in a room by myself and looking at a video screen, talking to my fellow actor. Uh, but that quickly kind of got out of the way for me. And I was in the scene and, and working with Susan. When, once we lined the benches up next to each other, it really started to feel like we were out on West Cliff and we were sitting on a bench. The lighting was a little off, but other than that, it just, it just seemed to really work. Uh, you know, someone is asking in the chat room, who wrote each script? And oh. Lori wrote every single script. Do you want me to respond to that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Talk about uh. that. Actually, maybe that fits into the question we have, which is, um, can you tell us how you came to write these plays? Was there a particular incident or image that you had in mind when you started the plays? Well, I've been working with this group of playwrights for five years now, and I get so much inspiration to write and revise. I write a lot, especially these past two years, lots of poetry, fiction, and probably close to 30 10-minute plays now. How I came to these three plays is the same way I come to all of my writing that I type into my keyboard. I observe what goes on in my life and the lives of others. I eavesdrop a lot. I'm proud of it, actually. <laughs> I write down things I hear as I'm walking down Pacific Avenue, things like, I'm so in love with the French president right now, but that's a different story. That line has made it into other pieces. <laughs> um, in my daily online journal, I keep a log of what I call light bulbs ideas for future pieces that might be two words long or two paragraphs. So any incident, any image can make it in as a light bulb and I'll come back to it later see if it fits into a current thought or can be paired with another thought. For me, it really is all about the pairing and the combining. The impetus for season tickets was that I have had Best of Broadway tickets in San Francisco since 1977. 
Almost everything in this play has a foot in reality. Like watching Next to Normal and thinking that every one of us exists on that elusive continuum that was described in that play. The 33 year relationship between uh, Barry and Sheila was of course fabricated, but that grew out of you know the what if question that I always like to pose that opens so many dramatic doors for me. What if two people who've been coming to the same theater for 33 years have had no idea that they've been on each other's mind the whole time. With Bench, the idea grew from walking out West Cliff Drive and reading the names and inscriptions on brass plates on benches and wondering about who these people were, what their relatives were like. <clears throat> After Effects was a little more personal. Um, I wouldn't say that the uh, I wouldn't say that the set, Nat, Nat and Allie's actual bedroom, was identical to mine and Karen's, but very similar. Um, if I can find it quickly, I'll show you an image of our bed and you'll have a better understanding of where this play came from. Let's see. I think I saw the question come up, do we live together? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, three years ago, we were married. Uh, this is our actual bedroom. <laughs> and this is the bedroom it was based on. Wow. With yeah. a pillow and a pile of books on it. Um, <laughs> and uh, now, the drama in our story wasn't about a miscarriage, but a health diagnosis. The pillow appeared, the tower grew, its intent became all too obvious and I had to write it even though I wasn't sure what the it was yet. Mike, we can't hear you. About now. Okay, cool. So Scott Ellis posted a question about how hard was it to, you know, uh, act and all this other stuff. So Scott, if you're still there, the, the weird thing about um, the side-by-side -side ones directing it is we're always looking there, so it's really hard to see actually what's truly going on. So I had to take screenshots at different key points of the play so that I could review the screenshots afterwards and see like what's the, where are we looking relative to, to when. So what happens is, if, if you bear with me here, I'm going to turn my computer. I had to set up certain spots like I'm going to say that line at that sticky I'm going to look into those pair of eyes right there. And so it was all done using screenshots to try to adjust where I'm looking and how it's going to become, look like and stuff. And then my, my handy little cheat sheets glued on with painter's tape and held in place by a little power bar thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, a couple of people are asking questions that seem related to Spike, which you commented on. And um, one was talking about um, what is the similarity, similarities, I think they're saying, in these situations, in all these plays, as actors change to this new reality, and then someone else says related to that, um, let's see, have you thought about if you will continue to write for this new medium? So that this person is thinking that you're actually writing for this medium. Huh. That's interesting. Um, I don't know if I should go into this part of it. Uh, oh. I, I avoid writing about the medium of COVID for the most part. I intentionally have avoided it. I, you know, I just completed a couple books of poetry in which I wrote about two other C words that were eminent in my life, um, cancer and chemo. And when the third C popped up, I thought, damn it, I don't want to write about another C. I want to uh, just keep moving on and avoid it if I can. Now in Bench, uh, because of the nature of the, the script, Susan as director decided to add the masks at the end, which made perfect sense. 
I didn't write it that way initially, but it definitely needed to be added in that one. Um, I have a feeling I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of both, but I, I will try to avoid talking about COVID and Trump and other things that make me sick to my stomach. <laughs> Um, oh, here's one. Um, funny question. If we want to go there, how did Nat and Allie get the dog to take such good direction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, knew that was going to come up. Uh, I wouldn't say he took the best direction, but, um, you know, it was a reality of performing in our house. You know, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a new medium and he's also a puppy, so... It's not so easy just to, to get him to calm down. Um, but yeah, you know, we were trying to find anything to like deal with him and try to minimize his effect. Um, and Wilma just said, you know, we had, a, we had a read through where we just were like, all right, the dog is here. We're handling him. He's running off. We're picking him up. We're allowing ourselves to be in the characters and in the story while this is happening. So frustrations with what we're talking about, and the dog making noise and moving kind of just work together as they often do with a pet. Uh, um, and and Wilma just loved it. And she said, go ahead, do it. She said, work with it and uh, let it happen. And, you know, as all of us are live theater people, you know, sometimes a piece of furniture falls over. Sometimes, you know, I think, you know, I've been on stage when glass is broken all over the stage and you don't stop the production. You just, figure it out. It so. looks like Wilma has something to add to what you're saying. Well, I also think that um, Nat and Allie are such good actors that it gave them a chance to use their improv skills just a little bit because each time they did it, the dog did different things and, you know, the dog's going to steal the show unless the actors really know what they're doing and they did. Mm -hmm. So I thought it added a lot of fun and realism to the play. Yeah. And I, I felt that the last uh, no, little barking notice he gave that he wanted to be picked up was perfect timing, ending up with all th in their arms as they were embracing. That was beautiful. So we, good job. We have, a, we have a few other questions here, but oh, one of the questions that uh, we sort of thought of earlier was, you know, when you're, as actors, when you're working in the same space, you have this ability to connect with each other. How was it, did you feel like that was impeded? Did you have to do any workarounds? How were you able to reach connection? Helene. Well, it was really bizarre. I mean, I'm basically looking at a plant. <laughs> I'm facing a plant. Um, but what, what Spike and I did, um, which really worked really well was, um, we rehearsed a, a couple of times, actually just facing each other on another Zoom call. So we actually could see each other and feel what, what would normally, mostly, except we can't, you know, we're not in the same room, but at least we could see each other. So that really helped a lot. Cause then when I'm looking at the plant, I'm remembering Spike's face and how he looked when he was saying certain lines. So that helped a lot. And I had this, um, a, a music stand where I have my script up, you know, and it's like, a, it's a, it's very bizarre, but it works. Yeah. Thank you. Allie. I can talk to it on a different kind of thing. Um, we're in our house. And for me, that was a challenge because if you've ever done a play with Nat or I, you kind of know that we like to get to the theater. We like to be in the space and warm up. We have routines, we yeah. stretch. We have all these theater warm-ups that you do, um, and being in the theater is one of the magic parts, right? It's it's the way that your character becomes where you go. You switch from your day to job, you get off work, then you go to the theater, then you shift, and you become this other character. Being in our house, and especially in our bed, was a challenge because how do you pick up this character and then let it go, and now we're, we're going to have dinner after this, and watch TV right here, so it, it, that posed a challenge. I missed the space of the theater. Yeah, it's the theater is my church feeling. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah, this is, this was, um, you know, when you go to the theater, there's a really beautiful safety about it. I think you just feel so safe when you step into a stage or even a rehearsal space and you just kind of walk through that doorway and everyone knows what's going on. When you're in your house, your neighbors are probably like, oh, they're fighting again. <laughs> they've really been fighting a lot in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so, so that's always missed. And, you know, it's just, you know, we love an audience. Like, there's a reason that uh, I love center stage, because it's a little space that you can feel everybody. Or mm -hmm. when we do it up in, in uh, Mountain Community Theater, we do it in the three quarters. Mm -hmm. And you can really be with other people. And that's, you know, that was a challenge that we both had to come over and say, okay, this is different. Yeah. Get over it's it. a different experience than doing a show on stage. What was nice is the writing. I mean, Jory created these characters that were so real and easy to put on. Um, you know, the relationship between Blair and Alex is, is oh, this is the night that it's, it's going to be different. The pillow comes down and that's a big moment for both of them. Um, so it was beautiful to do and such, it was nice to do here in a bed. I, it actually probably was easier than creating a set of a bed and all this, <laughs> all in my bedroom. Yeah. And it felt private enough that we're having this really intense conversation. Yeah, it added a very interesting layer for us to be in the bed and having this conversation mm -hmm. that people are having in the bed. Yeah. So, yeah, I miss- It's credit to the writing. Yeah, the writing was wonderful, Jory. Thank you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, but have to say thank you again to Jory. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Jory, thank you. I, I see a question here from Ellen Osley that says, were there some positives or opportunities with doing virtual live plays? Well, one of them was that at one point in time, we had 188 people in the room and we didn't have to charge prices for tickets. So that was great to be able to have such a large audience be here tonight and and uh, see the fruition of everybody's hard work that this could not have happened without. Uh, there's another question coming in that says, who helped with video editing and recording? <laughs> so it looks like, so Jory, you're actually recording this now. And so you will edit it later on. This is everything that um, since 545 is, uh, well, since 602 has been recorded. And when we finish, I will edit it. Um, I, with my Zoom forward productions that occur on Friday nights, we, the 30th one will be this Friday. I've only um, done the audios because the videos are so large. With this one, I will probably figure out how to get the video up to be seen um, with both the video and the audio. Uh, where do you think you'll uh, put that up? Well, I will try to get it up to the frenzy.org website where the Zoom Forward uh, website is. But also, Deborah is now our webmaster for our 36 North website. So, so that's we probably the better spot for it. Yeah, we can put it up there. Absolutely. So it'll be um, large. It'll be a large file. Large file. <laughs> uh, does so can it, I, can I yes, jump in? Right. So yeah, I just want to address Ellen Osley's uh, question. So. Um, first, Newhart, if you're still out there, it's good to, good to see you again, so, so to speak. Um, I think the possibility and opportunity of doing theater like this, especially side by side, for actors, it's an issue of trying to develop first your character and your relationship in ways that are just completely foreign to anything you've been trained to do. <laughs> it's not even the same as being in front of a camera, because even in front of a camera, there's people around. So it's, it's this intensity of, of work on the actor's part. And then on the production side, uh, I don't know, like with Jory and, and Kathy and Deborah resolving all of these issues ahead of time, it, it's really complex. And I'm really thankful that all of us involved in this had these incredible challenges because um, frankly, Jory's work needs to be out there. And so I'm glad we had all that stuff coming together. Here, here. Yeah. Does does anybody have any other questions? Because we're we are probably getting to that place where we're going to wrap up. 
comments or questions? I just want to say again that we could not have done this without everybody here, and especially Kathy Chetkovich, who was an awesome producer and uh, knows how to dig in and get things done and knows people and makes things happen. So it was really a thrill to work with her and everyone else on this production. Yeah. So we'll, we're going to wrap this up and thank you again, jury and actors and directors for your terrific work. And thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us and giving us the opportunity to make theater again. I mean, special. We look forward to getting back on stage one of these days and to seeing you again here in the meantime. But for now, good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Yes, yeah. stay safe.